Okay, good morning and welcome everybody to day two of the Invasive Species Centre, Ontario Invasive Species Forum. Uh, my name is Colin Kasson and I'm going to be moderating today's session on behalf of the Invasive Species Centre. This session is going to feature a program update from the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, as well as two presentations on the emerging threats posed by wild pigs. Please feel free to note any questions you have throughout the presentations in the chat function on the GoToWebinar panel. And I'm going to be sorting these questions out throughout the presentations. We'll have our, uh, all three of our presenters uh, be addressing each question at the end of our block of presentations this morning. So hitting lead off today is Jeremy Down, the Senior Invasive Species Policy Advisor for the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Jeremy was a member of the team that developed the Ontario Invasive Species Act back in 2015 and continues to support the implementation of the act and related programming. This includes collaborations with multiple partner organizations to develop and implement various actions intended to prevent or reduce the impacts of invasive species in Ontario. Jeremy's presentation will provide us with an update on recent and ongoing collaborative actions that the ministry is taking to reduce the threat and prevent the establishment of key invasive species across Ontario. Jeremy, I'm going to hand the controls over to you now and we'll be off and running. Okay, Colin, hopefully you can hear me and see me. Just waiting for the uh, pop up. I can see you, I can hear you. I'm uh, just passing the ball over. Give me a second here. Okay. So Colin's doing that. Oh, there we go. Okay, show my screen. Looks good, Jeremy. It's all good? Yep. Okay, so Keith told me I wasn't allowed, allowed to make any bacon jokes uh, despite the uh, subject of this morning's session, so I'll, I'll skip skip those for the start. But I did just want to start by, um, you know, thanking the ISC team and Elizabeth, uh, you know, for pulling together this forum. Um, it's just another great example of the, uh, you know, the collaboration and partnership that exists between the, the Centre and the Ministry of Natural Resources and, you know, and the great outcomes that come as a result of, of that ongoing partnership. Um, and how that supports, you know, broader communication and collaboration amongst the various uh, partners and organizations and, and, you know, members of the public, Indigenous communities uh, in Ontario. Um, I also wanted to just quickly thank all the presenters and, and all the folks that are participating in the forum uh, this week, uh, again, for, you know, sharing their knowledge and advice and experience and, and participating in the dis discussions throughout the course of this week. Um, I'm just going to give a, a really quick update on a, a few activities um, that the ministry has been doing with respect to the Invasive Species Act. Um, I promised Eric, Erica and, uh, and Keith that they, they could have the bulk of the time in the session this morning. So just a quick reminder. So, I mean, in terms of the ministry's role in invasive species management, so really we are the lead ministry in Ontario. Um, our role is primarily to support collaboration across all levels of government. So federal, municipalities, uh, provinces, interstate, uh, you know, and within, you know, across uh, North America. Uh, we focus on assessing the risk of, Ontario, of invasive species to Ontario's environment and economy, and obviously where um, appropriate actions can be taken, we lead or support those actions either through you know, partnerships or other, other me mechanisms. Uh, we sit on a number of binational, federal and provincial committees and support efforts to address invasive species you know, throughout Canada and, and internationally. And we support various research actions into the development of effective prevention, uh, detection, monitoring and control tools. Um, obviously, we work with a number of partners to proactively communicate about the impacts of invasive species um, and try to inform Ontarians about what they can do um, as individuals to try to reduce those threats. So just a bit of a species highlight. Uh, so water soldier, this is a species that you know has been the focus of many of these types of discussions in Ontario for several years. Uh, it was first detected in the Trent Severn waterway back in 2008, and that was the first um, kind of in the wild report of this species in North America. Uh, it, it likely came in through the ornamental pond trade. Um, so there's been long-term ongoing eradication efforts for this species in Ontario. Um, two primary focuses, one in small ponds, um, and that's really been led by the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, um, as well as the, the larger population in the Trent Severn Waterway. Um, there was a smaller population in the Black River several years ago, and then we had a new detection uh, in Red Horse Lake uh, this summer that uh, will be the focus of a discussion this afternoon, I believe. Um, there is an interagency working group uh, that was established to support, you know, research, uh, you know, uh, monitoring, detection, uh, communication outreach, as well as the, the physical control activities that have taken place. Um, so this is a really good example of, you know, a species that nobody really knew anything about uh, when it showed up in Ontario. 
you know, over the course of a number of years, um, you know, through that partnership and collaboration, um, you know, we figured out a successful strategy to to hopefully eradicate this species from the province. So hopefully, folks have seen the you know the slide, the pictures on the side of this. This is just uh, you know uh, two pictures from a multi-year series of images in terms of the the level of infestation at this particular site and you know the success of the control uh, that that occurred after after the herbicide treatment. So I mean, in terms of lessons that we've learned from this species and how we can apply this broader. Um, I mean, this is a species that requires complete treatment. Um, this isn't one of those species where you can kind of dabble a little bit here and a little bit there. Uh, it really did require, you know, ongoing monitoring and planning and, uh, you know, a very uh, targeted uh, control, ac control action uh, for it to occur. And obviously that's, you know, over the course of a number of years. So again, planning for those follow-up treatments, uh, both from a resourcing uh, as well as the partnership perspective. It really identifies the need for early detection and this is and the communication and this is where you know the small pond conversation has come into this one that we are getting reports of you know a backyard pond where water soldier occurs or you know the red horse lake for example where you know there was a small population in front of a cottage um, public engagement is key in terms of the, the use of a herbicide in this case uh, being the most effective control tool and, and educating and informing and addressing any concerns that arise from the potential use for herbicide and just the ongoing communication. So again, you know, we haven't quite won the battle with this species yet. So keeping the public informed and you know continuing to support that uh, desire for the public reporting and information. It's a really good example of how partnerships are critical. The ministry could not have done or addressed this species by itself. Uh, so through the interagency working group, uh, you know, particularly with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters and Parks Canada, uh, this project has seen a lot of success. Um, access to effective control tools is key. Uh, so in, in this case, we did have a, a tool that was available and it was effectively and success, has been successfully used. And then the you know, regulating a species under the Invasive Species Act in this case did help to close you know, the pathway of introduction. So it can no longer be brought into Ontario and sold, for example. European water chestnut is another example where the ministry has a long history, well, I shouldn't say long, but several years of history uh, of partnerships and control and eradication action. So again, uh, first, uh, you know, showed up in Voyager Provincial Park, and that park has been dealing with this species for a number of years in terms of control actions. Uh, we had additional populations pop up in Lake Ontario, the Rideau Canal, and we've had a new report of a population in the Welland River uh, as of uh, this fall. So again, this is another really good example of how partners and collaboration can support uh, long-term eradication efforts of, of an invasive aquatic plant. So the reason I wanted to highlight these two species is just to make the, the audience aware that we have put out prevention response plans under the Invasive Species Act for these two species. Uh, the intent of these plans is basically to allow uh, control and eradication actions to be undertaken by organizations, members of the public, etc., uh, without needing to come to the ministry for an authorization with respect to the prohibitions that are in place for those species. Uh, the response plans are available on our website, and I would encourage you know folks to to take a look at them if they have an interest or they're aware of a population uh, of these plants in an area that they have an interest in. Another one that I just wanted to quickly highlight is tench. So this is a, a new uh, invasive fish uh, that we are kind of I, I guess what we call the early stages of the invasion curve. Um, so it you know it has been creeping up the St. Lawrence River um, from Quebec, and we have had recent detections. Uh, in Ottawa. So, uh, you know, the biggest area is in Lake St. Francis, um, but we have had uh, one-off detections in Bay of Quinte, another one up in the Ottawa River, for example. So again, the ministry is working with a number of partners with our, 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 great, our Lake Ontario Management Unit and a number of researchers to better understand uh, the potential, potential implications of the, you know, this species spreading and establishing in Ontario. Key to this is work with the commercial fishers uh, in that area. And, um, I mean, in terms of the netting effort from a detection perspective, um, the, the amount of uh, time they spend on the water and the, the, the net days in the water, you know, completely blows out anything that the, the ministry or, you know, in partnership with DFO that we would be able to, to undertake. Um, we do have a binational working group, again, on this particular species, looking at, you know, implications uh, in the upper St. or yeah, kind of at the mouth of the St. Lawrence leaving Lake Ontario, and then if it were to move up into the Great Lakes. In terms of the Invasive Species Act, so hopefully everybody remembers last February, we did put up an early engagement posting on the potential, um, you know, looking at regulating or seeking information on a number of species as well as watercraft as a carrier. Um, the objective at that time is to gauge public support and seek additional information that would help us understand the potential impacts and potential benefits of regulating those species. We received 69 submissions uh, in response to that posting. 
And although it's taken us a bit longer than we had intended, uh, we have been working on a regulation proposal uh, for those species. So I just wanted to quickly uh, remind folks. Um, so we are looking at watercraft as a carrier, again, looking at applying the clean drain dry principles. So the idea around, you know, draining water from your watercraft, removing aquatic uh, vegetation and um, in aquatic organisms that may be attached to the hull. Um, so we are we are hoping to come up with a regulatory proposal to you know essentially put some of those rules in regulation rather than just requiring on you know education um, and, and awareness from that perspective. From the species again, so there's red swamp crayfish, marmot crab, and then New Zealand mud snail. Uh, New Zealand mud snail is the one that is already in in the lower Great Lakes, um, but we are trying to keep red swamp crayfish and marmot crab from becoming established. Uh, there are some issues in Michigan with red swamp crayfish right now, and this, if you think about crawdads or you know your southern boil, that's the species that's primarily used in in those circumstances. The next one is the knotweeds. Um, so back in 2016, we did regulate Japanese knotweed. Uh, since that time, we've had some issues or challenges around identification of knotweed in terms of whether or not um, occurrences are Japanese knotweed or one of the other species, and that has created some issues uh, for enforcement um, in terms of the application of the Invasive Species Act. So the decision at this time is to add uh, or to propose to add those additional species, those additional knotweed species. Uh, aquatic plants, so we're, again we're looking at fanwort, yellow floating heart, and European frogbit. Uh, fanwort is in Cachabog Lake in the Crow River watershed uh, east of Peterborough. Uh, and then yellow floating heart and European frog bit are kind of in the you know the, the southern Ontario, some inland and some Great Lake uh, wetlands, for example. And then Prussian carp, Kench uh, is on the list. Um, and then the, the subject of this morning's uh, talk, obviously wild pigs. So again, we are looking at uh, putting in place some regulatory rules uh, for these. So I don't have a specific timeline at this point in terms of when that regula regulatory proposal will come forward. Um, but we are hoping that, you know, in the spring um, before the summer that that will be available for public uh, review and comment. Just quickly in terms of the ministry's approach to uh, wild pigs. Um, so we are, we've broken this in kind of into four boxes. So communications, uh, collaboration, research and policy. Um, so again, looking at providing information, seeking reports, um, you know, to encourage uh, the public to be aware of the potential challenges and report sightings of pigs. Um, there's a lot of activity going on in terms of, you know, interjurisdictional work. And then I believe um, Erica is going to cover a lot of the research work that we've been doing. And from a policy perspective, so again, we're looking at potentially regulating uh, this species under the Invasive Species Act. And there is also a, uh, a, a management strategy under development that will be available for public review and comment as well. So just a quick slide just to, you know, identify some of the things. So again, we are looking for reports through wildpigsofontario.ca. Uh, we continue to use our website and traditional as well as social media to share information and encourage uh, you know reports um, and we are working with other jurisdictions to better understand you know the challenges they have faced um, and, and how uh, we might incorporate that into Ontario's actions to address and prevent you know obviously prevent the establishment of wild pigs in Ontario and then there are a number of uh, federal and territorial um, working groups looking at various aspects of the wild pig issue, issue from you know ecological as well as disease as well as agricultural risk. Um, so that was just a you know a really quick snapshot. Um, again, if there's any questions or, or concerns, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, and with that, Colin, I'll pass it over to Erica. That's great. Thank you, Jeremy. I'll uh, I'm going to give Erica the power here in just a second. Uh, appreciate you making that presentation. So. We're going to pause, as I said before, on uh, questions until the end of all three presentations. So just as a reminder, as I get Erica queued up here, if anybody does have any questions they'd like to know, there's the chat function uh, or as well, there's the question function as well within GoToWebinar. So you've got a couple options there. Uh, free, feel free to record them as you go, and I'll try and uh, collate them all together towards the end of the session for our three speakers. And so I think we're sharing now, almost, there we go. Okay, Erica, you should get the controls in a second. Thanks, Colin. And we can see okay. and hear you and your okay. slides. So you're and let's try that. Okay. That's Great. Good. Hi, everyone. So thanks so much for joining me today. I am really excited to talk to you a little bit more about our research. 
Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about the Wild Pig Pilot Project. And so first I'm just going to give a little background on wild pigs. Um, and I'm not going to spend as much time on this as I like, but uh, we're going to get into the meat of it. So that's what we'll be doing. I'll talk about our monitoring program and the status of wild pigs in Ontario. I'll talk about our pilot project and our research and then uh, get into some, some next steps. And I'm just going to move things around here on my screen a bit. All right. Okay, so what is a wild pig? We want to make sure we're all talking about the same thing here. So a wild pig is any pig that's outside of a fence. And that includes the sort of three main groups of pigs that we see coming in in Ontario. So those would be domestic pigs, like your sort of regular pink pig or a heritage breed pig um, that's livestock. Um, then we do have pot-bellied pigs um, that uh, we see in Ontario that are often uh, sort of pets and we see Eurasian wild boar and so the important thing to remember here is that uh, all pigs um, sort of have tusks so if you see a pig with a, a tusk doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, a wild boar. Um, domestic pigs and pot pigs can grow really coarse thick fur and uh, you know when they're exposed to cold that happens more often and so they may look pretty woolly. And all pigs are the same species. They're all suscrofa and can interbreed. And so this means that you can have a variety of hybrids running around. And uh, we see this quite often in the United States where wild pigs are sort of a mix um, between these different uh, sort of groups of pigs. So where are wild pigs right now? And where did they come from? So what we do know is that wild pigs are invasive. So they're non-native in North America. They were brought into the Southern US states uh, quite early on. So as early as the 15 or 1600s. Um, but you can see here on the map um, in my presentation below that they sort of started in the Southern US states um, sort of crawling northwards every year. And I'm just going to show you how much that range has now increased. And this map is only showing until 2012. So actually, they've moved even further north. So we are seeing these sort of pockets of pigs popping up um, in the northern US states. And I'll talk more about that in a second. In Canada, um, in the 80s and 90s, there was sort of a push to diversify agriculture. And that included um, encouraging operations uh, farmers to to farm Eurasian wild boar. And there were very few wild pigs that were seen in the 1990s, 2000s. But then as we go on in time, you can see that in those prairie provinces, we are seeing more wild pigs um, in the later years. And so I just want to note here on this map in Canada, um, it's showing wild pig presence or occupancy. That's not the same as a population. So you'll see these sort of dots in Ontario and that could mean that one or two pigs was seen in a watershed, whereas you might see you know, 300 to 500 pigs in a similar sized area um, in the prairies. So just how invasive are wild pigs? And I know Aaron and I had a presentation where we basically talked about this for 45 minutes, so I'm gonna try and cover it in one slide. Wild pigs, one of the best quotes about them is from Coaston Brooks in 2017. So they are one of the most prolific invasive mammals on earth, and they cause extensive damage to agricultural crops, native ecosystems and livestock, and their reservoirs of disease. And so what we see is that pigs, um, they will eat almost anything. So they destroy crops, you know, properties, golf courses, yards, sensitive habitats like wetlands. They use their noses and their tusks to sort of uh, dig underneath the soil and turn up that soil quite a bit. They also spread disease. They're known to carry um, over 70 parasites and diseases to livestock, to humans, and also to our native wildlife. Not only that, they compete with native wildlife and sometimes even prey directly on it. So we see effects for things like um, ground nesting birds, amphibians, reptiles. They will even prey on deer fawns. The most difficult thing about these creatures is how um, they reproduce and spread and what that means for control. And so we know that um, a wild pig sow or a female will become sexually active and mature at around six months of age. That is really early for such a large mammal. 
Um, they're basically the rats of the large mammal world. So a wild pig can have two litters per year, and in each litter she's having between six and 13 piglets per litter. That is incredible. And so we see that these animals are quite capable of surviving in winters. They're capable of reproducing a lot, so many babies, and they can quickly cover new ground. And so once they're established in an area, they're extremely difficult to remove. And I'm gonna talk more about this because I think it's really important. And I know that Keith is going to cover this in more detail, but I think that um, it's a really important message. So wild pigs have been called a management paradox. And this is because we have not seen that uh, recreational hunting has been able to control their numbers in other jurisdictions across North America. So why is this? Well, first of all, wild pigs live in groups and these groups are called sounders. So um, sort of like an older female and her young and their young. And when you spook animals in this group, for instance, by um, you know following them or trying to hunt them, um, they become very educated quickly. And so they'll disperse into new areas, they become nocturnal, they'll go into the deepest, thickest wetlands or swamps or forests uh, where it's very difficult to access, and it makes managing them and removing the whole group very difficult. In addition to that, because of those really fast reproductive rates, it's necessary to remove about 80% of the population annually just to stop population growth. And so this means that in areas where wild pigs are hunted, for example, in Texas, recreational hunting can only remove about 24% population, 24 of the population per year. Um, and so we're nowhere near that sort of 70 or 80% mark. And one of the metaphors we really like to use is trying to get rid of wild pigs is like trying to mow the lawn. You can mow that lawn, you can get rid of those pigs every year, you can do it you know, every two weeks, but that lawn is always gonna come back unless you know, you basically get underneath there with a rototiller and scrape it away or something. So Dr. Ryan Brook, who's one of the lead researchers on wild pigs um, in the prairies and in, in fact in Canada says, you know, sport hunting actually helps them survive. It breaks up the sounders, so those groups of pigs, and it educates them. So if you want more wild pigs, have a hunting season. And just to explain this in a little bit more detail, how, how exactly that happens, how hunting accelerates the spread of wild pigs, you might say, well, you know, here in Ontario, we, we have very few. So a hunter might say, okay, well, if I just shoot one, you know, isn't that going to be a good thing? Well, yes, you know, you might get rid of that one pig and so that you won't see that individual in, um, in year two or in year five. And this is just a hypothetical example. But what we've seen in other jurisdictions is sometimes hunters travel to other places, for example, you know, Texas, where hunting is allowed. Um, and they say, hmm, that was that was a pretty good experience. I really enjoyed that. Then what happens in year two, and we see that many, many populations of wild pigs in the northern U.S. states have actually been seeded by illegal translocations of these animals to new areas. This is incredibly concerning because we know about those fast reproduction, reproductive rates. That those animals could quickly form a new population. And the other thing is what I've already talked about. So when you have a hunter and uh, they shoot into a group of wild pigs, which is their basic social unit, they might take two of those animals away, but then in the next year, you know, okay, there's fewer, but then the next year, these pigs and their progeny are smarter. They're avoiding humans, they're nocturnal, they're not going to be found. Okay, so if recreational hunting isn't the answer, you know, what do we propose to do? Well, we've looked to see what other jurisdictions have actually been successful in removing wild pigs from their areas. And so what we're seeing is what's called whole sounder removal. And that's what's halting the spread of wild pigs. So in this case, if, if we're leaving this sort of one pig and we're not shooting it, you know, maybe it lives to year two, but maybe it dies by year five by itself. What we're actually seeing in Ontario is that um, this one pig is often an escaped um, farmed animal or pet. And it's somebody that, you know, somebody might report it and think that it's a wild boar, but it's, uh, it's actually a pot belly pig. And the farmer or the owner is actually able to come and recapture it. The biggest thing that we're looking at right now is what's recommended by the US Department of Agriculture, New York, Colorado, the prairies, you know, they, they haven't gotten rid of the pigs in the prairies, but they're saying, you know, we wish that we had used whole sounder removal. And so this is when you use a corral trap 
to trap the entire group of pigs and remove them at once, which means that none of the individuals is educated um, to realizing, okay, you know, people are, are dangerous and we need to avoid them. So this is how we're, um, we're looking at removing wild pigs. Okay, so now I'm going to get into our wild pig monitoring program here in Ontario. So this basically started back in mid-October in 2018 when our wild pig website was published. And this is the place where we were started to solicit sightings and to share information about wild pigs. So it has some basic information about the morphological characteristics of pigs, you know, what do they look like, uh, where might you see them, and how to report them. So um, here in Ontario, if you do see a wild pig, it's any pig outside of a fence, you're going to report it um, to wildpigs at ontario.ca or to the iNaturalist uh, wild pig reporting program. And uh, so we didn't just use our website though, we really wanted to get the word out because we know that Ontario is a really big province and uh, there's lots of places uh, where we're concerned, you know, we might be concerned about. And so we tried to raise awareness about these animals through uh, media and social media campaigns. And so, you know, we've been talking to reporters, we've been doing radio interviews, we've been putting lots of posts up on our social media. There's been a lot of um, media outlets that have picked up this story and have sort of spread it around. And so what we're seeing now is that about 15% of our sightings of wild pigs are actually repeat sightings of the same individual. So we know that the word is getting out and that when people see these animals, they are getting in touch with us, which is really great. And so when we receive a sighting, um, we have a provincial sightings database where we're inputting all of that information. And so all sightings are entered into this secure internal database and we collect comprehensive data for each one. Um, we started out this project sort of using Microsoft Access and then uh, we realized very quickly that this wasn't going to work for us. We needed something that was spatial, we needed something that was accessible to all team members in real time, and we needed somewhere where we could really effectively store the pictures with the sighting so that we could go back and remind ourselves of you know, what exactly that one pig looked like. Is it the same as this other sighting that came in a week later in the same area? And so what we started to use was ArcGIS Online. And we're really leveraging uh, that suite of applications to help us share and work with our project data amongst different team members. So for the most part, we're using um, ArcGIS Online, uh, Survey123, Field Maps, and Dashboards. And I really, uh, if, if folks are out there and they're doing field projects and they haven't switched to ArcGIS Online yet, I really urge you to get into this because it has been so huge for our team. And one of the, the biggest sort of helps that we've had is in designing our wild pig sightings database form. And so if you've been a data monkey in the past, as I have, you know how helpful it is to have a form that has specific categories for all of the data that you're entering so that you can quickly answer questions that people might have in the future. You know, how many sightings did you have where, you know, damage was reported? How many sightings of confirmed, uh, you know, domestic pigs versus Eurasian wild boar. And so having this form has really helped us um, organize our data and make sure that, uh, you know, the quality assurance and quality control are in place. The best thing about using ArcGIS Online products is that these data are available to all of our team members. And so I'm gonna talk more about our pilot project and our research technicians that are investigating sightings on the ground. And so we're sending them data in real time and they're sending us data in real time. So they can see all the project data on their cell phones, on their tablets, on their laptop computers. And this has been extremely helpful to us, especially um, in COVID-19 times when uh, we might not always be able to get together in the office to talk about our work. And I will just show you an example of how much data we do collect for any given sighting. And so we collect a lot of information about where the sighting occurred, when it occurred, even when it was reported because we wanna know um, how much our media outreach is affecting when we're getting these sightings. Somebody might see a pig and then only report it a year later. We collect information about how many animals there were, uh, whether or not they have since been contained, uh, what a priority, you know, if they're a high priority for investigation and things like uh, the picture of pigs. And this is an example of uh, pot belly pigs that were later recaptured by their owner. 
Okay, so we've been collecting these data for just over two years, and so we have an idea of what the status of wild pigs in Ontario actually is. And I really want to, right now, you know, I have an acknowledgement slide at the end, but there have been so many people that have come together to create this project and to really make it what it is. And I'm, I'm just one part of that bigger team. So um, we've learned so much since we started back in 2018 and uh, everyone's been really committed to this project. And I, and I think uh, we should be really proud of what's happened so far. So this is the first question we usually get uh, from a reporter or from individuals that are asking us, you know, how many wild pigs are there in Ontario? This is a really tough question and it's tougher than you might think. So a lot of the sightings we get appear to be domestic or potbelly pigs. And we don't always know if those pigs have since returned to captivity or have died. And so um, people will submit a sighting, but they won't necessarily give us a call if they find out, you know, two months later, oh, that was my neighbor's pig and it's back now. We might um, have numbers that are underrepresented in some areas because wild pigs are less likely to be reported in areas that have fewer people. And so in areas where you've got um, a lower human population density, um, you've got fewer people to report and therefore they may not detect pigs even if they're there. On the other hand, in areas like southern Ontario, uh, you have lots of people and we do see evidence for multiple people reporting the same pigs and we really try um, to note when that happens and we have a field for that in our database but it's not always possible especially if the pig wanders quite far or if sightings of the same individual come in over several months. Finally uh, the last thing is you know while our reports are indicative of how many pigs are on the landscape the number of reports is also closely related to our media coverage and I'm going to show you a graph here and this is from a paper that um, Aaron and I have been working on so using citizen science to monitor an invasive species and the graph is showing time along the x-axis here and then the number of events on the y and so what i'm going to show is how media events are actually related to the number of wild pig reports so you see here when we have more media events we have more wild pig reports and while we expect that this um, effect might sort of attenuate or decline over time we are seeing evidence for the fact that, you know, in a week where we don't have any media attention on wild pigs, we might see between zero and one sightings of pigs on the landscape. But when we have uh, multiple media events, we're seeing between three and four sightings per week. And so uh, those sightings might not be from that week, they might be from a half a year ago or two years ago. So it's been quite interesting for us to look at that, but it does make it really hard to tease out um, how many pigs there actually are out there on the landscape. The second um, question, and I think probably the most important one that I'm going to try and answer in this presentation is, are there established populations of wild pigs in Ontario? And what we're seeing from all of the information that we've collected over the past two years is as of right now, March 2021, no, we do not see evidence for breeding self-sustaining populations of wild pigs. And so I'm just going to bring your attention to this graph here over on the right. And this was updated uh, just a few days ago. And so what you're seeing here is the proportion of our sightings that come in with one pig with, you know, I saw multiple pigs, but there were no young or the pig was reported dead or there were multiple pigs with young. And so what we're seeing is the vast majority of our sightings are of a single pig and if you recall back to when I talked about the basic social unit of a wild pig, it is a sounder that, you know, it is multiple pigs that are surviving with young. And we know from our colleagues in the United States that they're saying, you know, when you see um, sightings that are coming in of, of multiple pigs, multi-generational and lots of sightings in the same area over a short period of time, that is indicative of established populations. And we're not seeing that here in Ontario. So all the evidence suggests that our province is in prevention mode. However, there are several locations of concern. There are places where we've received sightings, you know, and maybe we haven't received any sightings from that place in the last couple of years, but do we know for certain that those pigs are no longer there? We don't. And so we really want to maintain that vigilance, we want to continue to monitor, and we want to continue to take action both on the research and the policy fronts 
because we think that's really critical to preventing the establishment of this invasive species. Okay. We can talk about, however, where these sightings are. And so I'm going to show you uh, several maps on the following slides. And I've updated these maps again a few days ago. And they're going to show you all of the wild pig sightings that were reported and observed on the landscape after October 15th, 2018, when our monitoring program started. And these maps are going to include cases where the pigs are known to have been recaptured or otherwise removed or were reported dead. And so I'm going to talk more about the status of, of uh, sort of our overall caseload um, at the end of this after we've exited the maps, because I think when we see all the information together, it can be a little bit overwhelming. So not shown on these maps are duplicate sightings of the same pig. So if five people call in and uh, report uh, the same pig, um, I'm just going to show you the one most recent sighting of that animal. We're also not going to show sightings uh, where we're unsure if it was actually a pig. So these are sightings that come in where somebody sends us a picture of something that later is determined to be a possum or a raccoon or, you know, it's deer tracks. We just don't have confidence that these are actually wild pigs. Okay, without further ado, the first map here is showing animals that have been determined by the picture. Um, that we've been sent in or sort of by an expert review to be a domestic animal. And many of these sightings are animals that have recently escaped the farm or, or sort of captivity. And many of these sightings have, we know to have, or have likely returned to their farms. And so you can see here the picture on the bottom is domestic pigs. You know, they've, they've sort of wandered from an enclosure uh, and they've gotten out. And so this is, you know, indicative of sort of this pattern that you see over here on the left in the map and sort of all over uh, southern, eastern, and central Ontario. I will say that uh, we do have maybe five sightings from a northern and northwestern Ontario, um, but I did want to show the detail, or sorry, of all wild pig types, but I did want to show the detail in these maps here. We get a lot of sightings of pot-bellied pigs, um, and a lot of these sightings come in and somebody will say, I saw this wild boar. It had tusks, it had black fur, it had a crest of black fur along its back. It, it was definitely a wild boar. And when we look at the photo, um, to us it's clear because of that sort of pushed in snout, uh, the lack of a lot of fuzziness on the ears, that big belly, the short legs, there are a lot of um, sort of tells that that animal is actually a pot belly pig. Some of these are sort of the neighbor's pet that has wandered away, um, but sometimes they do turn out to be feral. A lot of people will buy pot pigs thinking, you know, it's a mini pig, it's a teacup pig, but actually, um, you know, pigs do grow to be quite large and have an attitude and some are abandoned by their owners, unfortunately. We do also see evidence of wild boar. And you'll see on the map that we have far fewer cases of, um, of confirmed wild boar in the province. And so these are con confirmed sort of by their, how they look, they're from those pictures. And so these uh, sightings are a priority for investigation. And I'm gonna also note that many of these sightings occur close to wild boar farms or where we know that wild boars have been kept in captivity. Finally, uh, you can see that um, these are sort of our unknown sightings where we don't know what type of wild pig it is because we don't have a photo. And so if we don't have a photo, we can't confirm the type of pig. And so they could be any of the pigs that I've talked about on the recent slides. And I'll just note that, you know, while this looks like a lot of sightings, I'm just gonna point your attention to, you know, this is like one sighting. Um, and um, I'll show a map at the end that, uh, that talks about sort of our, our density of wild pig sightings and what that might mean. Okay, so where are wild pigs in Ontario coming from? And I've alluded to this a little bit, but I wanna talk about it in more detail. Um, Aaron and uh, Hans Ellington and I have been working on a manuscript that's in preparation to evaluate the potential sources of invasive wild pigs in Ontario. And when we started this project, you know, we really didn't know, you know, were there established populations? There wasn't you know, we didn't have this monitoring program, so we, we really didn't know. And so when we started out, we asked the question, you know, could wild pig sightings be coming from existing wild populations in Ontario that we just aren't aware of? 
And again, we would expect to see that if this were the case, we would see evidence of sounders, like lots of sounders of wild pigs reported in the same area in a short period of time. And we just, we aren't seeing that. We aren't seeing those clumped distributions of sounders of wild pigs. So we don't think that that's happening here right now. Could wild pigs be invading from neighboring jurisdictions? You know, when you look at this map of the population or the occupancy of wild pigs in the US and in Canada, you know, it looks like they could be sort of closing in um, from those borders. And if that were the case, we would expect to see wild pig sightings uh, that were sort of clustered around the edges of Ontario near to those other places. Again, we're not seeing any evidence for, for that. And, I'll also just point out that many of these places have programs in place like Quebec and New York to eliminate any wild pig sightings as soon as they're um, detected. And so it's unlikely that pigs would be coming in at this point from some of those borders. Um, so we're, we know that that might happen you know, in the future and we're being really careful to monitor for that. But right now that doesn't seem to be the case. The last hypothesis we investigated was escapes from captive sources within Ontario. And indeed, uh, when we look at the distribution of the sightings that we've received, it looks like um, you know, domestic livestock and uh, potbelly pigs are really closely associated with known premises with domestic pigs, which makes sense. So our sightings of domestic pigs are on average only about three kilometers away from the nearest known pig premise. And with our wild boar, they're about 14 kilometers on average from the nearest wild boar farm. So this seems to point for right now the escapes are from within Ontario, but we know and we're preparing for the fact that that might change. And we think that continued vigilance and monitoring and action is really critical to prevent the establishment of this invasive species. And just to kind of give you a hint at that, you know, these are wild boar or wild boar hybrids that are were recently for sale in Ontario or near our borders. And so I think a lot of people are unaware that wild boar and their hybrids are a farm species in Ontario and that while they're while they're not common, um, you know, we do have them and that escapes do happen. Okay, so now getting into more of the meat of the presentation, um, our wild pig pilot project. So what, what was this project exactly? And so when we started to become concerned about these sightings, uh, we had dedicated ministry staff, so research technicians and myself and Aaron coordinating a team. And those technicians would investigate these high risk cases. And so uh, we would use baited trail cameras and community outreach to detect these wild pigs on the landscape. So if we got a report, uh, the technicians traveled to that area and tried to learn more about the pig. You know, is it owned? Is it actually a wild pig? Is somebody trying to find it? Or you know, could it actually breed and start uh, start a problem? And so these are some examples of the reports that we got, you know, a feral potbelly pig near the Cardin Alvar in Ontario. And that pig must have been reported to us four or five times as a wild boar because it did have tusks and a very furry coat. On the right here, these two pictures are from the same area. Um, this was a suspected pig in the middle image here. You can see a sort of rotund animal walking away from the camera and um, damage in a nearby cemetery that looked very convincingly like wild pig. Um, but when our technicians went in to investigate, they realized uh, through our trail cameras and also through talking to community members, this particular area had a very active grub population and that grub cycle was every three years. And the community members said, you know, every three years, you know, the raccoons come through, through and absolutely destroy uh, some of our yards. And so. We saw evidence for that in the trail cameras and also from people. And so we determined um, that animal in the middle is actually a coyote, um, just with a bushy tail um, and just a funny angle. So the goals of this project were to write and evaluate those protocols. So, you know, our animal care protocols are safe and standard operating procedures, that sort of thing, so that we could inform policy and future wild pig management in the province. And that's why it's, it's a pilot project. We're trying things out, we're researching uh, best management practices and techniques so that we can inform future management. We're also trapping and dispatching um, wild pigs where ownership cannot be determined and where they're deemed high risk and collecting biological samples and measurements from those animals. So this is, this is a picture from 
uh, more than a year ago now, so back in January before COVID-19, we invited uh, some experts from the New York uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, the Wildlife Services Branch. So Mark and Dan came up to give us uh, a big workshop on how to detect, detect pigs, how to recognize them, how to work around them, how to trap them. It was a really great uh, workshop. And we combined and adapted protocols uh, from New York and other jurisdictions that have successful programs or that have you know, a lot of lessons learned from how to deal with these invasive animals. And because of working in a global pandemic, eventually after the first three months of the project, uh, we used Microsoft Teams and ArcGIS Online extensively to share documents and data uh, during this time. So some folks are really interested in the equipment that we're using in the project to, uh, to trap or detect these animals. And so we have two corral traps, as is shown on the left. Uh, so far, we've been able to get away with smaller corral traps versus the, the larger ones that are used in the, in the United States. And um, you can see here that the trap is in the sort of open door position, and it's left like that for several days until the animal gets used to it, and then um, it will trigger that door to close behind it. You can also see on the right a sort of a mesh style trap, which is really interesting. It's almost like a, a minnow trap or a lobster trap where you bait the inside of the trap and the pigs will, because of that rooting behavior, will root underneath the mesh. But then once they're inside the trap, they can't get out uh, because they're standing on the mesh. Um, and we haven't tried this one yet, but we're excited for maybe we don't want to, but uh, I think it'll be interesting. We've mostly used the trap on the left. Other equipment that we use are our trail cameras. So we have 33 trail cameras and 25 of those trail cameras are like the one uh, pictured on the right. And these are cell enabled trail cameras, which send pictures to our cell phones and to a web application to us um, in real time. So about twice a day, we're getting updates from these cameras. This is really critical to us because it allows us to monitor these sites in real time and to respond really rapidly and to not have to go to the area and, uh, and disturb any wildlife that's there. Uh, one of the really interesting things about uh, this, this brand of camera that we're using is that um, it actually has an artificial intelligence built into the web app and it has filters for the different game species that you might be interested in, we're interested in wild boar. So if you use that filter, it will try and pick out all of the images of wild pigs that it's picked up. And we've found that when we position the camera close enough to the bait, um, it will actually pick up um, wild pigs 94% of the time. When they visit, uh, we'll get at least one of the pictures from that visit that will be flagged as, as a wild boar. So that's been really, really helpful for us and really exciting. I think I talked about earlier how um, in the busy season, so not potentially in the winter, but in the fall and the spring and the summer, you know, we get between three and four sightings of wild pigs in a week. So how do we prioritize which sightings to visit? Um, we're, we're not in New York, they've got a smaller state, we're a very large province, and so we do have to make some decisions about which sightings are going to be prioritized. So we ask a number of questions right now to try and figure this out. So are the pigs of Eurasian wild boar descent? We're more concerned about this type of individual because we know from our partners in the States um, and from in the prairies that uh, pigs that are Eurasian wild boar or especially boar with hybrids with a hardy heritage breed are known to survive and reproduce more successfully in the wild than their domestic counterparts. So we would investigate um, cases where they're known Eurasian wild boar. Are they reproductive or traveling in a group? This is of concern because it's easier for you know, pigs that have a lot of young um, to make more. And it's also a concern because you know, if they're young, maybe they've never been in captivity and this could be an issue uh, because they would be more wild. Are they surviving in the wild over multiple seasons? So generally, you know, potbelly pigs aren't as much of a concern for us because you know, they're not known to survive and reproduce as, as easily as those Eurasian wild boar or hardy heritage breeds. But if we see that these animals are surviving in the wild over multiple seasons, well then, you know, are they causing damage? They could be spreading disease and uh, we might go investigate. And again, if they're causing damage, uh, it might be cause for some sort of investigation, even if uh, remotely, just calling folks and trying to figure out uh, who, who does that pig belong to? So just an overview before I get into a couple of, of case studies that you might be interested in. 
the wild pig project sort of by the numbers. And so you can see in the map below, there's 25 locations that our technicians have investigated um, on the ground or in, in quite a bit of detail. And so um, you can see here the three locations in green are sites where we're still investigating. So we have active investigations in those locations right now. There are some purple locations where our technicians uh, did site visits to try and confirm the presence of wild pigs, but we're unable to confirm. You know, we might have had a trail camera photo from uh, 2019, and our, when our technicians go there, they set up trail cameras, they talk to people in the community, but they're unable to verify that pigs are still in the area. So we're still monitoring those locations uh, quite often. Uh, you know, we've we've put out lots of of um, you know, calls and um, actually I'll talk about this in the next point here. We've actually had 401 conversations with residents across these 25 locations. And in places where we can't, you know, knock on doors, uh, we've left notes with 531 additional residences. So we're fairly confident that if wild pigs were to be detected in these areas, uh, we would hear uh, from people in those places. The brown points on the map below are places where we've investigated and we've been able to close the case. So either pigs weren't implicated or they were recaptured or removed. And in fact, we know um, from our work that 46 pigs in these locations have been removed or recaptured in the places where we've done site visits. We know more also about pigs where we haven't visited sites and I'm gonna show that soon. One pig was euthanized and I'll talk more about him in a minute. We've deployed um, over 60 trail cameras and we have uh, about a quarter million photos. It takes a long time to go through all those. And we've had about uh, four, I think we've had four cameras where pigs have shown up on camera. Okay, so now to get into some case studies. And these are really sort of our more um, exciting case studies that I picked out to talk about today. And um, the first one I'll show you here was a case where a domestic sow um, and seven piglets in the wild were reported to us. And um, I'll just show you the video and you can see the trap here in the video, but I'm just gonna show you what she looks like. Okay, so you can see that those piglets are, are quite young. Uh, we did some calling around and found out that um, actually this was uh, a domestic sow, sow known as an Ossabow Island pig. We became quite concerned when we heard this because we know that this particular um, heritage breed of pig is quite capable of surviving and reproducing in the wild and other locations and that her piglets had been born in the wild. And so when we dug a little bit deeper, we found out that these pigs were from a nearby farm. However, the farmer had been unsuccessfully trying to recapture these animals because she had crossed a, a deep um, and fast moving stream when she was pregnant and then had given birth on the other side of the stream. And he was unable to walk her down the busy highway that separated, or that, you know, there was a bridge over this busy highway, but she was unwilling uh, to go on the road. And he was worried about her safety and about his safety because she was quite protective. And so um, we stepped in because we really didn't want these piglets growing up in the wild and potentially reproducing. And so we brought the trap down to this area and we taught the resident how to bait the trap, how to use the trigger um, and how to catch these pigs. And so you can see here, uh, some really great evidence of our corral trap working to, to catch the, the whole group. And so, you can see here just some more pictures of these of these animals showing uh, sort of those wild pigs in the corral trap. And uh, you know she became quite comfortable uh, around the trap and, and would lie down. And these are some pictures that we got from the landowner. So we're appreciative of those pictures. Uh, later that summer, so this past summer, we received this photo from uh, someone in Springwater Township. And they were reporting um, a Eurasian wild boar that had been coming uh, to their baited trail camera. And we were really concerned about this because of the fact that those animals are more likely to survive and breed in the wild. And so we immediately stepped in. We set up about five trail cameras in the area and we started um, asking around. So and during the course of our investigation, we did determine that there were several wild boar farms in the area. Um, but none of these boar farms uh, could claim ownership of this animal. And uh, the animal had been, you know, 
been out there for a little bit of time by the time we learned about it and we were quite concerned and so uh, we came in like I said with those trail cameras we baited five locations and within five hours uh, one individual uh, which was the only individual that had been reported um, came to that location and started um, eating our bait and so we accustomed him to this and sort of left him alone for a few days we stopped baiting the other trail cameras so that he would keep coming to the same spot. And then we placed our corral trap um, with the door open for about five or six days. And so he was coming in and out of the trap regularly. He was visiting for longer periods of time. And when we would determine that he was quite comfortable going in and out of the trap, um, we did set the trap. And so you'll see here, this is a picture of the inside of that corral trap. And this is a line that leads to the open door. So it's holding the door in the open position. And there's uh, what's called a rooting stick that's held in place by these two stakes. And so because of that rooting and, and digging behavior of pigs, um, they will usually sort of root up to try and get at that bait. So it's a mixture of corn, uh, oats, and also jello because pigs apparently love strawberry jello. And he'll move that um, rooting stick and then the door will close behind him. So we did humanely euthanize this animal and Aaron was able to take samples um, and measurements. And this, this um, particular individual was sent for necropsy at the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative in Guelph. We do receive many calls regarding feral potbelly pigs that are often reported to us as, as wild boar. Uh, these are just some individuals that have been reported to us over the past couple of years. And um, in some of these cases, we do work with local animal control um, or the municipality. They often know who the pig belongs to and can help get in touch with the owner. In some cases, uh, we also work with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs uh, because um, they've got a lot of resources about sort of keeping your animal fenced and the importance of you know, not letting it water on the road, to cause a motor vehicle accident or spreading disease. And they can talk to these landowners and, and um, these owners about um, you know, practices and, and, and let them know that it is their responsibility to keep their pig um, enclosed or um, under control. So this is a graph that shows the current status of those recent wild pig sightings. And so these are all sightings that have been reported to us um, on the landscape between October 15th, 2018 and uh, just about a week ago, February 24th, 2021. And so this is the percent of all of the cases on the y-axis and on the x you'll see there are three groups of pigs so those domesticated pigs the ones we're a bit less concerned about the unknown pigs where we don't know what kind of pig they are and a wild boar here on the right so i'm just going to bring your attention to the wild boar uh, location here on the right so see here um, all of the sightings that we've received of recent, you know, sightings of wild boar on the landscape since we started monitoring have been investigated. They're, they've either been investigated and we can't um, confirm that they're still on the landscape in that area, or they've been resolved, wherein the animals have either been removed by the owners, um, recaptured, or euthanized by us. And so uh, we're proud of that stat. Um, on the other hand, you might see here, okay, you know, you've resolved the number of cases with these domestic or unknown pigs but why is it that you know there's a bunch of cases that are unresolved especially with these unknown pigs well some of these sightings are quite old and we know that after about six months it's very unlikely to actually see that animal um, in the area again and when we receive a single sighting of a domestic pig or an unknown pig uh, that's not as much of a concern uh, for breeding or surviving in the wild as is a wild boar or a group of pigs. Also, um, when we receive a sighting of an unknown pig, if it's a pig that's been sighted, say, in the middle of Etobicoke or in the middle of uh, the city of Brantford, it's less likely that it is, in fact, a true wild pig and that somebody isn't sort of chasing after it, trying to get it back. In some cases, we'd like to investigate further, uh, but the initial report comes in and the person says, you know, I saw a wild pig in Simcoe County. And uh, we write back and we say, okay, you know, where did you see it? Um, you know, can you tell us what more about, you know, what did it look like? Um, when did this happen? And we don't get any response back. So we're not gonna send our technicians out to that area because we don't have anything more to go on than there's a wild pig in Simcoe County. And so we do have to sort of prioritize on these high risk cases 
but we continue to investigate um, all cases if they're deemed um, you know, that priority. So what, what have we learned through all of this work and monitoring wild pigs in Ontario? So I think one of those take home messages that I've mentioned before is that we don't yet see evidence of these established populations. And so you see here, um, there's sort of a legend item for established populations, but there isn't any on the map. There are lots of places in Ontario, especially in Northern and Northwestern Ontario, where we don't have a lot of sightings, but we know that there's fewer people to report those sightings. So that's why we've indicated this by sort of no data. We're not sure about these areas. In the rest of the province, the highest density of sightings we've ever received per year is about three sightings per thousand square kilometers. So imagine Peterborough County, that's about, that's about nine or 10 sightings in that area per year. And that's the highest density in any place. And so normally it's about one sighting per uh, thousand square kilometers. And so this means these sort of one-off disjunct isolated pigs are not necessarily meeting other pigs um, or able to breed with those pigs. So it's a pretty low density, but we are still maintaining this vigilance because of the fact that we know wild pigs have been so successful in other areas and that it only takes a few pigs to turn into a big problem really, really fast. Okay, so I am winding down. I've just got one last section to go before I, I turn it over to Keith. So what are our next steps? You know, what are, what are we doing next in, in our search for wild pigs and how to deal with them? One of the things that we've been working on is readying our lab for environmental DNA sampling and analysis. So some of you may have heard of environmental DNA or eDNA. And very simply, um, any animal that's sort of walking around will shed small quantities of DNA and they shed them in the water. They can shed them in their footprints, in the soil. Um, it's pretty amazing. And so the easiest place to detect this sort of shed DNA is when an animal walks through a water body. And we know that pigs like to be in water, especially in the summer, because um, they can't sweat. And so they have to regulate their temperature um, by going into, you know, wallows, puddles. They like wetlands, that sort of thing. And so if we get a sighting of wild pigs that's in a pretty remote area, where it's going to be hard for us to, uh, you know, maintain those trail cameras or bait them consistently. Um, and we know that there's a very... Um, there's a very small chance of there being other pigs in the area, for example, uh, pet pigs or domesticated pigs. We can actually use eDNA to detect pigs. And this is a, a method that's being used in the United States to determine if an area is pig free. And so you can see a picture below of myself in the middle there with a ladle. You can see pig pig on the left. This is pig pig's watering hole. And this is a local farm that is helping us out. And Kayla, who is our lead uh, lab technician, our genetics lab technician, who is helping us uh, get uh, what's called a positive control. So we know that Pig Pig and the other pigs in this area have drank from this water source. We know that pig, you know, pigs are all the same species. So if we are able to detect Pig Pig, we know that that's sort of a positive. And so we can compare that to our negative controls and know, you know that now if we go into Northern Ontario and collect samples, we can tell the difference uh, between our positive and negatives. We're also sharing what we learn. And so one of the things that we've done recently is to put out um, an annual wild pig sightings report, and you can find that on our webpage. And it's just a document that talks about the sightings that we have and, and what they mean, and we'll be uh, drafting the new one pretty soon. We're having lots of meetings with partners, so both internal and external, like within our own ministry and also external stakeholders. We're doing presentations and, and uh, we're having conferences or we're doing conferences. And so we're not only doing this kind of thing, but also talking to naturalist groups and agricultural groups. We're doing these site visits with residents where wild pigs have been detected and talking to those people in their areas to say, you know, have you seen them? This is what you do if you see a wild pig. This is how you report. When people report sightings to us, we chat with them about what wild pigs are and what they can do. And we're also publishing or preparing a number of scientific papers out of, out of this research. I think Jeremy um, covered this really well, but I just wanted to um, sort of give a shout out to our partners in the MNRF Fish and Wildlife Policy Branch. It has been 
an absolute pleasure working with the folks in the biodiversity and invasive species section on this file. We've been working really, really hard with them to provide them with the science background to inform those policies um, that are being proposed. And they're continuing to learn both from you know, what we're learning in the Ontario context and also you know, from our partners in the prairies and in the United States and even across, uh, across the ocean about you know, sort of successes and failures with wild pigs and what that means for management in the Ontario context. With that, I will spend a little time just acknowledging our larger wild pig team. Uh, you can see Aaron Cohen and I on the right. Aaron uh, has been amazing on this uh, and um, you know, this is definitely a group project. You can see our three uh, wild pig technicians in the photos, uh, Andrew, Kat, and Aiden, and also just other folks, uh, for example, the USDA, uh, folks at Esri who have been supporting us and using ArcGIS Online, and especially all of the community members um, who have reported sightings and who have chatted with us about what they've seen. Uh, so with that, I will uh, hand it back over to Colin, and I uh, really appreciate uh, everyone coming uh, to this presentation. Erica, that was wonderful, and uh, thank you very much for the great background. I, I apologize, mid-presentation I realized I didn't do a very good job giving your, your proper introduction, so I apologize for that, but um, what a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, flip the controls over to Keith now, so we should jump off of your screen in a second here. And okay, there we go. Awesome. Thank you, Erica. So I, I do see a few questions coming in, just as my last reminder there. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, we see them in the question box coming in. So if you want to throw them in there, that would be great. And we're going to field them to all speakers at the end of this. If you have any questions or comments in the chat, feel free to throw them in there as well. I have been trying to put as many links and notes down in the chat function as well, just um, as our speakers do refer to some tools and resources, you can find them there as well. So uh, make sure you check that out as, uh, as Keith gets underway. So Keith, I've, I've talked the control over to you there, so uh, I'll, I'll make sure I remember the introduction this time here. Uh, so Dr. Keith Monroe is Wildlife Bio at uh, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, where he works on issues related to conservation of wildlife as well as associated fields like disease and species. Keith comes from a science and research background where he's lucky to work with a wide range of species, including white and black-tailed deer, small mammals, and turtles. Uh, his current job lets him work on everything from rust grow, rough grouse to moose, and he absolutely loves it. Hunting has been successfully employed under North American model of wildlife conservation to ensure ecologically sustainable populations of wildlife across our continent. However, hunting is obviously not an effective uh, management solution in the wild pig problem and can in fact contribute to their spread as we learned. Hunters still have an important role to play in the early detection and reporting of wildlife uh, and wild pigs. And so Keith, over to you to tell us a little bit more. Great. Thanks a lot, Colin. You can hear me and see me. Good. I can hear you and see you. I've lost your screen. Oh, I, I took it off because I realized I was over everybody. But you can see my opening slide right now. Looks good, Keith. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for having me. And uh, one of the great things about following up uh, with Erica is um, these, you know, tandem presentations are nice because you can each of us can kind of focus on our issues and not have to, you know, rehash all the sort of basic biology stuff. So thanks a lot, Erica. So today I'm a, oops, sorry. Today I'm really going to try to cover three things. I'm, I'm going to try to provide some context around Ontario hunters and uh, the issue of wild pigs. I'm going to talk about the impacts of hunting on wild pigs and wild pig control. And then I'm going to end with some work that we've been doing at the OFH to really try to harness hunters' enthusiasm and concern about this, this issue. So context is really important when talking about hunting and wild pigs. Most of the discussions around you know, hunting and wild pigs is at a North American scale. Um, and so a lot of the sort of you know, jurisdictional nuances are lost. Um, when you look at hunting at that North American scale, um, hunting has contributed to the spread of wild pigs across North America. And then in some jurisdictions, you also have conflicting management goals of both wild pig damage control, but also maintaining hunting opportunities. And this really conflicts with management. But when we're talking about um, wild pigs in Ontario, this sort of North American context really doesn't represent the situation we have here 
And that's because we don't have an established population of wild pigs in Ontario, as, as Erica mentioned. So because of that, um, you know, wild pigs are not something where we you know, are currently trying to um, manage them for, for you know, conflicting goals. And our focus is very much on just, just keeping Ontario wild pig free. And then the other thing is that by far in Ontario, hunters have been the most vocal voice um, for wild pig management and uh, you know, wild pig control. So just to kind of give some, some background to that sort of claim that we've been a, you know, a really vocal voice on it. Um, so the OFAH has been active on wild pigs since about 2014 when we were uh, involved in some communications around wild pig escapes in Eastern Ontario. But in 2018, we really stepped up our efforts on this file. Um, and the reason for that was that at that point in time, wild pigs was really not a topic of conversation in Ontario. Um, There's no information you know, on the Ontario government's website about wild pigs. And as Erica mentioned, there was, was really not a, a wild pig monitoring program in the province. But we started hearing anecdotal reports from, from our members in the hunting community of sightings of wild pigs, and, and that started to concern us. Um, the impacts of wild pigs once you get them is, is really well documented and it's really easy to look at you know jurisdictions in the United States and in, um, in the prairie provinces and see what can happen if you don't address the potential issue really quickly. Um, a really good example of, of or analogy is a you know a fire. As soon as you get those sparks or, or smell smoke, you want to investigate and deal with it immediately so it doesn't grow into a much bigger problem. So our first step to that was we put out a call to action among our members. We, we put it in our magazine, the Ontario, the OFH publishes Ontario Out of Doors magazine. Um, so we put out a call in the magazine to our members saying, hey, if you're seeing wild pigs, let us know about that. Um, and I can honestly say my hope was that I wasn't gonna get any sightings. I was gonna be able to say, okay, that's not an issue we have to worry about in Ontario. We can you know, move on to other, to dealing with you know, other topics. But we did get sightings. So um, this map just shows the rough sort of ge uh, geographical location of the sightings we got. So kind of spread across, you know, Southern and Eastern Ontario. Um, in no way was this, uh, you know, a scientifically rigorous survey. It was simply a, you know, a, a shout out to say, hey, if anyone's seeing anything, let us know. But we did get reports and that was enough for us to, you know, to realize that this was something we potentially needed to be more active on. Um, so we used these reports to start conversations um, with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Um, and then following that, they, they launched their own monitoring program, at which point we stopped asking for, for sightings um, and just directed people to the MNRF's own reporting system. Um, then in, in 2019, we sent a letter to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry laying out what we felt were the necessary steps for keeping Ontario wild pig free. And I will say that these are these are not original ideas to the OFH. Um, one of the, the I'll say benefits of dealing with wild pigs in Ontario is there is a huge amount of knowledge um, from our colleagues in the U.S. and in the Prairie Provinces that we we can lean on. So. Um, people who dealt with wild pigs early on in those areas had to do a lot of trial and error, um, and we get to benefit from, from their knowledge. So what we requested was that the MNRF you know, establish a central reporting and monitoring system, um, create dedicated staff positions, um, investigate all sightings of wild pigs and remove them from the landscape, um, report on those sightings so the public knows sort of what's going on, and then also explore the feasibility of listing wild pigs under the Invasive Species Act. And as you saw from you know, um, Jeremy and Erica's presentations, um, those things are being done. So we're, we're, we're really pleased with that. We continue to be active on wild pigs. So in, in 2020, the OFH joined uh, the National Invasive Pig Working Groups. Uh, these are working groups run by the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative um, through, funding with, um, through funding from Environment and Climate Change Canada. And then um, we've had ongoing you know, education campaigns to, to talk to the public and talk to you know, specifically our members about wild pigs. And in 2021, we're launching some new detection and education initiatives. And I'm gonna talk about those at the end of this, this presentation. So why is the OFH so active on wild pigs? And I kind of touched on this with my fire analogy, you, know, you wanna deal with it quickly, but what are the actual concrete things we're worried about? So the OFH is a, is a conservation first organization and it's documented that wild pigs negatively are, you know, are bad for conservation. 
Um, so this is, you know, to try to capture it very generally, this is a, a graph from a paper by Ivy et al. in 2019, um, where they looked at uh, essentially biodiversity in forest fragments with and without wild pigs. And they found that regardless of the size of the forest fragments, um, wild or the fragments that had wild pigs um, had lower um, biodiversity, lower vertebrate species richness, about 26% lower um, than the forest patches that did not have wild pigs. I, I should say that this, this research, I believe, was carried out in Michigan. I should, I should know that off the top of my head. So, you know, across the board, definite, you know, negative potential impact on biodiversity. There's also, you know, even more directly related to the OFH's mandate is, is well-documented negative impacts on both wildlife and fish. Um, so Erica, you know, touched on this, and there's some really great re resources put out by the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture's Wildlife Services. I lean on their materials quite a bit. Um, but wild pigs impact wildlife through competition, uh, predation, and disease. Um, essentially, they'll, they'll eat the same things as our native wildlife, they'll eat our native wildlife, and they'll spread disease to our native wildlife. So uh, a big problem we want to avoid. And a really good, you know, example of this is, is wild turkey in Ontario. So um, wild pigs have been shown to reduce the nesting success of wild turkey. Uh, wild turkey are ground nesting birds, so, they're, um, so their nests are particularly vulnerable to, a, you know, an omnivorous species that explores everywhere when looking for food. Um, and in Ontario context, you know, wild turkeys are a real conservation success story. So organizations like the OFH and the MNRF and other partners spent a huge amount of resources and staff time and volunteer time to reintroduce wild turkeys with the result being that they're so widespread. So um, having wild pigs in the province, if they became established, directly impacts, you know, not only very important game species, but a very important part of Ontario's, you know, biodiversity. And I will say, it's just a, as a shameless thing, um, I'm trying to out cute piglets with uh, turkey chicks. So people opposed to wild pig control often put up piglets. Uh, and so my counter for that is, is cute turkey chicks. They'll also, wild pigs will also negatively impact fish through and, and other aquatic, you know, animals and habitats. Um, through the de destruction of fish habitat and the degrading of water quality. Um, wild pigs don't sweat and they extensively use, you know, water sources and, and mud holes and wallows uh, to, to stay cool. And as a result, they um, can really destroy those environments, both through sedimentation, like you see here, um, as well as, you know, shedding diseases into, into, excuse me, into water sources. The other big thing that, and Erica touched on this, is agricultural damage. So um, the agricultural community is, is a very important partner for the hunting community. And we share a lot of common initiatives. Uh, we work commonly on a lot of things. And in, through a big chunk of the province, you know, hunting relies on farmers for, for access. So we're very concerned about things that ne could potentially negatively impact that industry as well. And wild pigs are, are definitely one of those. So. In the United States, annual damages are estimated to exceed $1.5 billion annually. And that's from things like, like crop damage, as you see here, or um, conflicts with, with livestock, um, which could be competition for food sources. You have a little bit of a, you know, a confrontational situation going on here. It could also be the um, direct predation on, on the young. So um, fawns, or sorry, not fawns, uh, lambs, are particularly vulnerable to, uh, to wild pig predation in the United States. And then also disease. Uh, we've covered that before. The, wild, uh, the pork industry is very concerned about African swine fever. Um, it's not you know, in North America, but it is in Europe and in um, Asia, and it's having some huge impacts on those industries there. And I'll say that the, the pork industry is a, a great um, partner in um, in trying to work towards keeping Ontario and Canada more broadly wild pig free. And then the last thing is the unknown. Um, one of the interesting things about wild pigs is that as more research is done, new negative impacts are learned. And so I think, you know, any wild pig researcher would probably tell you that we don't know everything that wild pigs do. 
And so there's definitely negative impacts that we, we don't know about. And so all of this is really what pushes us to want to keep Ontario wild pig free, because if we keep it wild pig free, we avoid all of these problems, including the ones we don't even know about. And just to reinforce what Erica said, so with that goal of keeping Ontario wild pig free, we know what works. Um, much like you know, when you have a fire, um, you call the fire department, um, wild pigs, if you have wild pigs or pig sightings, it needs to be handled by specialized uh, personnel with training and equipment. And I can't say, you know, the fire analogy is not original to me, so I can't take a claim for that. I got it from Dr. Ryan Brook. But what does work, as Erica said, is, is whole sounder removal, um, which is what the MNRF's pilot project has, has been working towards um, with trapping and appropriate techniques. And as such, hunters are encouraged to, re to report sightings. And this tends to make the discussion around hunting of wild pigs in Ontario easier um, because there is a solution that we can point to. You know, don't hunt wild pigs, report them to the MNRF so they can remove them. So we, there's a huge amount of interest in, in wild pigs among the hunting community in Ontario. Um, and, and not specifically on wild pigs, but more broadly on the topic of wild pigs. Um, a lot of hunters are, are, you know, justifiably very concerned um, and have, um, you know, understand the, uh, what needs to happen, you know, why trapping is important, why hunting isn't. Um, but there are a couple of attitudes that persist um, that are, you know, advocating for hunting or voicing that hunting should be how we deal with this. Um, and I think to be fair, that's largely driven just by, you know, people not being aware of the complexity of the wild pig situation. So Ontario hunters are, are extremely, you know, well-educated on issues, on long-standing issues in the province. Um, and they're very good at uh, very quickly becoming educated on new issues. Uh, chronic wasting disease is a great example of that. Um, that's an issue that, that our hunting community has learned about and is now quite knowledgeable about very quickly. Um, but wild pigs is, is not a long-standing issue. It's a very new issue. And so it's understandable that, you know, parts of the hunting community just aren't aware of the complexities of this issue. And that kind of manifests into sort of two attitudes I want to highlight and kind of break down a bit. So the first one is um, excitement around hunters, around new hunting opportunities without an awareness of the costs. So the broader sort of North American hunting media shows while pig hunting is, is very exciting, you know, it's a it's portrayed as a great opportunity and um, you know something that that you know something new and something exciting and something fun. And those you know those shows don't necessarily illustrate the cost that I touched on earlier, and that's why you know, I'll throw turkeys back up here because um, turkeys are, are one of those potential direct costs to having wild pig hunting opportunities in Ontario. The other um, expression that we see from a lot of hunters is a desire to help. And, you know, if we have wild pigs, let's let the hunters, you know, um, let's let the hunters deal with it. And I'm going to say that that is a 100% completely reasonable view for hunters in Ontario to hold, because that's how we deal with other issues of overabundant wildlife. So I'm a, you know, white-tailed deer biologist by training, so I have to throw white-tailed deer into a, any presentation. Um, but just to illustrate that point, I want to show, I'm just going to have a couple quotes from the population objective setting uh, and harvest management guidelines for white-tailed deer in Ontario. Um, and the goal of that, you know, that document um, states, you know, is to maintain the sustainable management for healthy populations of deer to provide a range of social, cultural, and economic benefits. And the way to do that is through hunter harvest management strategies to keep deer within their you know, desired range of abundance. So the desire for hunters to, to help similarly with, with wild pigs is completely understandable. And to be honest, it's, it's not necessarily the hunters that are wrong that hold that view. It's the fact that pigs were not set, were, the way we you know, use harvest management in North America was not set up with a species like wild pigs in mind. But unfortunately, Hunting cannot eradicate wild pigs, and the overwhelming, you know, experience from decades of management of, you know, in the U.S. 
shows that hunting is effective, ineffective for both control and eradication. And that's you know, laid out in the USDA's you know, technical guide. Um, I wish it did work. And I can guarantee you that if it did work, you know, wildlife management agencies would be employing it because one of the real benefits for hunting as a, as a management tool is that it's a revenue generating you know, activity. Um, hunters will pay to hunt um, as opposed to if you need to use specialized staff for control operations, you have to spend revenue. Um, and I think one of the biggest in, you know, sort of proofs that hunting is not an effective tool is that it's not more broadly used um, because it's just where it, hunting does work sort of in broader wildlife management. It's such a great tool. That's why we use it for you know, white-tailed deer in the province. So why wild, well, you know, Eric touched on this, but why, you know, hunting doesn't work is because you do need that whole sounder removal. Um, so hunters may kill some of a, you know, members of a sounder, but the remainder scatter, alter their behavior, um, and then any animals are you know, quickly replaced by reproduction. Erica, Erica touched on the, you know, the amazing reproductive output of wild pigs. And I think just to put it in context, um, so as Erica said, you know, uh, wild pig can, can become sexually mature at about you know, six months of age, and then have up to two litters a year of anywhere from, you know, the numbers vary based on what study, but let's say, you know, four to 10, four to 13 um, animals per litter. So contrast it with white-tailed deer, our most common big game species uh, or large mammal in the province. Um, white-tailed deer will have anywhere from one to three offspring a year. So that's in a good, you know, three is in a good area in a good year. So wild pigs are just on a level of reproduction, you know, just so much above anything else we have, you know, native in the province, which really goes back to that, you know, you need 70 to 80 percent minimum harvest just to keep the population stable. So one of the sort of un unfortunate things associated with wild pigs is that, you know, hunting seasons do spread wild pigs. And I just want to be really clear as I sort of talk about this subject. By far, the vast majority of hunters across North America are, you know, follow the rules and are extremely conscientious about the natural resources that we rely on and, you know, enjoy. So whenever we're talking about, you know, wild pigs, something that somebody has done to contribute to their spread we're talking about a very you know a very small subset of the population um, and i definitely don't want to paint all hunters with the same brush because that's in no way accurate um, but what we're seeing is the actions of a select few really are having huge impacts on you know the wild pig problem you know especially in the united states so much of the spread of wild pigs has been by people. Um, this is a study by McCann uh, et al. from 2018, uh, where they looked at um, the genetic structure of wild pigs in 35 US states. They had over a thousand samples from wild pigs. And without going into you know, all the details, because I'm not a geneticist, um, they concluded that the genetic pattern shows that the spread of wild pigs has been aided by human translocation, so people moving pigs. Um, each of the colors represents sort of a genetic cluster, and you can see by the colors kind of how much mixing there has been. Um, for example, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but they concluded that the wild pigs in Nevada were likely from California, just based on their sort of genetic similarity. And the unfortunate reality is that a wild pig population is really easy to create. Um, you get wild pigs from one area, you move them to another area, and you release them, and they do quite well. Um, this is a picture uh, taken by a, a game warden in Colorado of a trailer full of wild pigs, of Texas wild pigs, that have been illegally imported um, into Colorado, a state that had, after you know, decades of work, successfully eradicated. Um, wild pigs. And this is uh, a pattern that we've unfortunately seen quite a bit associated with hunting seasons. And that's because the creation of a hunting season 
um, incentivizes, it provides value to there being pits on the landscape. And that could be, you know, value to hunters, you know, from an exciting, you know, recreation or hunting activity or a source of meat, or it could be value for landowners because they can charge money for, for you know, wild pig hunting access. Um, but generally what you see is when you put in a hunting season, you incentivize there to be wild pigs. And that in some cases has led to spread. Um, and Tennessee is, depending how you look at it, either the best example or the worst example of this. Um, and this isn't to criticize Tennessee because they were dealing with this problem very early on and they didn't have the benefit of all the knowledge that we now have. So to criticize them would kind of be, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking, but I think it's still a really good example of what did happen. So in from the 1950s to the 1980s, um, you saw wild pigs in six counties with some limited expansion. That's in the two top maps here with the gray, um, the gray polygons, so the gray counties being the counties with wild pigs. Um, in 1999, a statewide open hunting season was instituted. Um, and by the time the season was closed um, in 2010, um, you can see in 2011 and 2016, wild pigs were found in, you know, bre breeding populations of wild pigs were found in nearly 70 counties. Um, and that came with an associated increase in property damage and crop damage. Um, so this is, a, this is a state where they had a hunting season and the problem got a lot worse. And just to be very clear, you know, I talked about this largely in the North American context, but there is no evidence that this is happening on, in Ontario. Um, as Erica mentioned, um, the best indications we have right now is that the pigs we do have are farm escapes. So we have no you know, indication that people are spreading pigs uh, or, or releasing them and hoping to create populations. That's just not something that we're, we're seeing. We're very vigilant for it, but we're just not seeing that. And that's, but I feel that caveat is really important for me to put out there. So now that I've talked about, you know, why wild pigs are, are you know, of concern to hunters and why hunting is not the solution, um, I want to talk about what, what are the contributions that hunters can make in Ontario to keeping the province wild pig free? Because we are seeing this, you know, real enthusiasm and concern about the problem. You know, when hunters get educated, they really understand why we don't want wild pigs in the province. And when I talk about hunters and sort of, you know, hunters, I'm a hunter myself, and I have just the same concerns as uh, both for as a biologist and as a hunter itself, for myself. So where we see an opportunity in the province is through contributing to surveillance. So the MNRF conducts passive surveillance, and this is um, asking people to report sightings when they're seen. And, and I'm not criticizing them, as Erica pointed out, you know, Ontario is a, a huge province and it's extremely, you know, labor intensive to conduct active surveillance across the scale of the province. But what we have, both as the OFH and um, the hunting community, is a large base of engaged individuals with outdoor skills, land access and equipment. Um, just if you're not familiar with the OFH, we're a membership organization. We've got about 100,000 members, subscribers, and supporters. So our members, um, people who donate to us and people who subscribe to our magazine, uh, we have additionally 725 member clubs, and those are spread across the entire province in, in nine different zones. So we saw an opportunity to leverage the engagement um, that we have from our members into supporting some active surveillance. So encouraging people to go out there and look for wild pigs and find them if they are there. And that comes down into two initiatives that we were, were launching in 2021, um, our wild pig trail camera detection protocol and our wild pig surveillance program. So our wild pig camera detection protocol is basically how to help people use their own equipment to go find pigs if they are present so they can be reported. Um, and what we did to do this is we reviewed the scientific literature on detecting wild pigs with trail cameras, and we distilled that information um, primarily into a two-page infographic. So this uh, was meant this was meant to be handed out at trade shows and events and things like that when that was something we did. Um, 
but now it's, it's available through our website. Um, and then we also have a more detailed protocol um, that's a four page document that goes more in depth into the science and the scientific studies that support the, the recommendations made um, on this document. So it provides information on how to detect and report wild pigs using trail cameras. And, and to our knowledge, this is a, a unique resource. Um, no, lots of jurisdictions ask for people to report wild pigs. There's a lot of great um, initiatives out there like uh, Squeal on Pigs, which is a very active out west and in the United States. Um, but to our knowledge, no one's actually giving people information on how to go look for wild pigs. So, um, like I said, this is available on our website. And if anyone's interested in adapting this to their area, to their part of the province, to you know anywhere else, um, I'm more than happy to chat about that. My contact information is at the end of this uh, this meeting or the, this presentation. But the downside of this um, this protocol is that we don't have an estimate of effort. When you're relying on people to use their own equipment and their own time and their you know their own resources, you you really can't be too prescriptive about how people do it. Um, you're relying on goodwill goodwill so you can't really tell people you, you must do it this way and as a result we, we have we it's easy to know if a wild pig is present because we'll have a picture of a wild pig but if, if someone puts out a trail camera in an area and doesn't get any wild pig pictures can we say there aren't wild pigs there or are we just saying we didn't look hard enough to find them if they were there and that sort of desire to get an estimate of effort was what kind of spawned our next initiative which is the wild pig uh, surveillance program. So this was provided, um, we got some funding through the Green Shovels Collaborative um, and Colin can actually speak more on that if anyone has questions about it. Um, but basically this program is based around an, a stock of OFH owned trail cameras. So we're, we're, we're buying trail cameras and this allows us to be more prescriptive about how um, and where they are deployed. So we're looking um, to set up a zone-based seasonal surveillance program. So identifying an area of the province and surveilling there. Um, and this is based on both the methods in the previous slide, you know, best ways to detect wild pigs, but also um, other successful monitoring programs like the MNRS chronic wasting disease surveillance program, as well as a really cool citizen science program called Snapshot Wisconsin. Um, but they're doing some really interesting work and I, I really recommend people look that up. So we just received this, um, this funding. So we're in the process of putting together the project and we're looking to pilot it this year. Um, this program is gonna be coordinated through the Invading Species Awareness Program, uh, which is a partnership between the OFH and the MNRF to address the threats of um, invasive species in Ontario. We're funneling our sightings through this, through the ISAP, because um, we, for two reasons. One, we don't want the MNRF to start having to ask, answer questions about our project. You know, my trail camera's not working and they email the MNRF. We want to keep people coming through us. Um, but also we have an established protocol um, to ensure that any sightings we receive are passed on to the MNRF with one, within one business day. Um, just as proof this works, Last week, we actually got a sighting or a report of a, what looks like a pot belly pig carcass that someone found. Um, and I think we got that to the MNRF within about 45 minutes. So ensuring that there's no sort of breaks in the chain of reporting. But the way this project will generally work um, is to identify a surveillance area. We'll put out a call for volunteers with specific criteria. Selected participants will be given a trail camera kit. Um, they'll deploy monitor and maintain those those camera stations over a fixed period of time um, any pigs that are seen will be immediately reported through the isap um, and then post deployment the camera is mailed back to the isap all the imagery is downloaded and then processed so our expected outcomes for this first of all is to detect wild pigs if they are present but then also to quantify the effort in order to be able to provide certainty around non-detections so this is just a Grab, you know, map I made up of Eastern Ontario, but ideally what I'd like to be able to say is, you know, we surveyed these green cells enough that we know that if wild pigs were there, we would have detected them. 
And then also what they were going to do is collect additional information on wildlife and the environment. Um, I've done wild pig work or sorry, trail camera work in the past. It's amazing just the amount of information you get just by having cameras out there. And so if you know anybody who does, who's interested in you know, studying, working on trail camera, any scientists, tell them to reach out to us because we're probably going to have a lot of stuff that'll be handy. And then yeah, shameless plug for a colleague, uh, if you're interested in the broader topic of citizen science, uh, check out Brooke Schreier's talk this afternoon. So in conclusion, um, the presence of wild pigs directly impacts conservation issues that hunters care about. Um, and in Ontario, hunters are the leading voice for wild pig control. Hunting is not an effective tool for wild pig control. It only serves to educate and scatter wild pigs, making control operations more challenging. Um, hunting seasons, in fact, have promoted the spread of wild pigs, unfortunately. But hunters do have a really important role to play in supporting early detection and response by reporting sightings and participating in our surveillance programs. So I'll end it there with a picture of a white-tailed deer uh, standing in front of a, you know, a wetland and a forest with absolutely no wild pigs. Uh, and that's how we want to keep it. So thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to Colin. Very nicely done, Keith. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, so I guess at this time I'll invite Erica and Jeremy to go camera on and we're going to, and Keith too, and uh, we're going to do a pooled question period here. So I see a few more coming in. So just as a reminder, the question function in the uh, control panel is what we're going to be using to address some of these questions today. I've scanned the chat and I don't see any there, so that's good to know. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll buy us a minute here just as we get a few more questions coming in, but please feel free to toss them in there as they come to you. Um, I think this question is best addressed for Erica, but maybe we'll go to Keith uh, after. But um, what is the market here for wild boar in Ontario? Uh, do you have any information on how many farms raise wild boar for meat? Okay, that's um, that's a great question. And can you just hear me, Colin? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so we know that um, Omafra does sort of try and keep track of um, wild boar specifically wild boar producers in Ontario, but we are only aware of those that have actually registered with Ontario pork. Um, and so there's about seven uh, wild boar producers in Ontario that are registered with Ontario pork. Um, we know anecdotally of a number of other wild boar producers um, through things like those Kijiji ads or you know, media and also our investigations on the ground. When we go, you know, when we find wild boar, we, we find people who have been farming wild boar. Um, so unfortunately, you know, there's there's not a whole lot known um, officially, but we also know of things like uh, when we have uh, producers, when they report, you know, at the end of the year, this is how many boar were, um, you know, taken to a butcher that specifically deals with that kind of animal. And we do have those numbers, although it's, it's not all of them. So from all of that, um, we know that there are relatively few people in Ontario that are farming wild boar, um, but don't have exact numbers. Okay, great. Um, the next question here is coming in. I, sorry, I think Erica, you addressed this after the question was asked, but just to rephrase. Um, so are there any concerns uh, related to the reproduction of feral pot-bellied pigs or wild boar as they spread throughout Ontario? Do they reproduce in generally the same way as domestic pigs? Um, okay, yeah, I can try and answer that. So we know, again, uh, I sort of talked about this a little bit, um, but we know that, so wild boar um, have a lower reproductive rate than domestic pigs. And so one of our main concerns is that what we see in the United States happening is that when you have a wild boar that you know, has these longer legs, has a thicker coat, uh, they are sort of designed to survive in harsher winter conditions. When they breed with domestic animals like a heritage breed, um, that can mean that the wild boar or those hybrids have the characteristics of both. So they're able to survive winters, they're able to move around quite a bit, but they do have a higher reproductive rate. And so those hybrids are the animals that we're seeing in other areas um, that are uh, very successful. 
Um, we haven't seen a lot of evidence in other jurisdictions, um, in other northern jurisdictions of highly successful domestic pigs or, um, or pot-bellied pigs. Uh, this changes as you go further south. So in the U.S., Obviously, as it gets warmer, you have greater success of domestic pigs that don't have quite as much, um, you know, that woolly, woolly coat and that sort of thing. So I'm not sure if that answers the question or if Jeremy or Keith wants to add anything there. Yeah, one thing I would add is that, so I think it's, re one of our goals is really to have no, you know, free ranging pigs on the landscape. And one of the reasons that I think that's so important, regardless of what type of animal that is, like if it's a pot belly to domestic pig or a wild boar, is I think we've gotten in Ontario quite lucky several times where, you know, a single wild boar type animal will get on the landscape, but it's the only one, so it can't reproduce and it's by itself. If we have other wild pigs out, like a pot belly pig that's wandering, um, you know, an escaped domestic pig, having other pigs out that other pigs could then breed with once they get loose creates a much bigger risk because as erica you know mentioned they're all the same species and they all interbreed so um while the wild boar definitely have those traits that will make them probably do the best in ontario if they get loose those other pigs the domestics and the popular pigs still have a very potential dangerous role that they could play if they're allowed to remain in the landscape and, and not just for emerging populations but also for damage and disease so mm -hmm. you know it, it only does take a pig or a few pigs, you know, if there is some sort of disease. Um, and, you know, again, we don't have African swine fever here in Ontario, but if it were to come to the province and there was even a small number of wild pigs that could spread that, we know that wild pigs are very social animals and that they will seek out other animals, for instance, on hobby farms, uh, where maybe the biosecurity controls aren't as stringent as on these larger commercial farms. So we do have concerns about that. And um, in some cases you look at these animals and you think, okay, well, this is just the same as like a cow that got out or a dog that's off leash. Um, but because of that pork industry in Ontario, you know, we do have to be, it's a big industry. It's a huge export industry. It's a lot of people's livelihoods. And so we want to, you know, control and be careful about that. Yeah, I think Eric and I both kind of touched on the disease angle. But we neither of us probably did it justice like the sheer number of diseases that that wild pig populations can carry that affect you know humans or wildlife or livestock or all three are crazy like it's um, like erica said 70 um i saw a presentation from a researcher in um, florida where they found that wild pigs we're potentially shedding 13 different waterborne pathogens that could affect people into Florida watersheds. So um, the disease angle is, is, is huge when it comes to wild pigs. Mm -hmm. Well, that's concerning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so next, next question coming in here is, I guess it's a related note, so we'll, we'll segue into this. So. Um, is there concern for a wild boar market becoming a little bit more lucrative and thus increasing the demand for them? It's, I think it's probably a recurring theme throughout our entire forum here, but it certainly seems to apply to wild boar too. And any thoughts on kind of that potential use trade-off? Yes, I'm concerned. Um, it, it's really that classic example of, you know, incentivizing something leads to there being more of it um, and even even if you know you have you know more wild boar farming because of a more demand for wild boar you know in the in restaurants or you know people's plates um, that means that there are more potential source populations um, the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture Food and Rural Affairs has, has some great resources on containment um, for wild pigs like fencing and, and guidelines for that um, but I'm personally concerned that, that if for any reason there's more wild pig farms, or sorry, more wild boar farms, there's the more risk of there being wild pigs. Okay, sounds good. I, I see a couple more questions, so maybe this will be our last call for anybody who uh, um, has a burning question to throw out there. So Keith, I think this one's for you. Um, just 
is someone expressing interest in using some of your infographics for teaching materials? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure, I, so I did circulate the link there uh, in the chat function so anybody can access any of those files that Keith had mentioned there, but uh, just want to make note of that for you, Keith. There's a request for your, your tools there. Sure, and you can drop my, uh, either directly to this person or in the chat, you can drop my email address in there if anyone's got any you know, specific questions too. More than happy to chat about any of that. Perfect, okay. Um, and I think that's all I see coming in there. So Jeremy, you're, you're off the hot seat. You did okay. So, uh, so thank you guys very much. So Jeremy, Erica, and Keith, all really great content and contributions to our form today. So really, truly do appreciate this. Um, there was a note here, uh, somebody asking about um, using some of these materials. So I, I think the plan, uh, as I understand it, is to circulate the recorded links for um, all registrants for this, so you will have access to the content as well. So we're not going away. And again, all of those resources have been linked down in the chat function as well. Uh, and speaker contact information was was provided as well. But follow up with us directly if if we can help um, thread any any needles there. I um, did want to make a quick selfish plug as well for the rest of the forum content. It's a busy day today, a busy day tomorrow, and lots coming on Thursday too. So um, did want to just make note this afternoon at, oh, sorry, at 11 o'clock, so in 10 minutes, we do have uh, other Ontario partners presenting on their annual updates, similar in format to what Jeremy had presented, but you're going to hear from a lot of other leading groups uh, that are working on the ground. So a quick, quick plug for that in a, a mere 10 minutes, a uh, separate registration link, so please look out for that. A great session this afternoon, as Keith noted, on community action as well, that's going to feature a number of species um, uh, sorry, a number of speakers talking about uh, uh, what's happening on the ground and at the community level on invasive species in Ontario. So a couple quick plugs for those, but lots of great content to come. So appreciate everybody tuning in today and appreciate very much the speakers for their time this morning and uh, looking forward to seeing everybody back in about 10 minutes in another session. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Colin.